Yeah. And so um, today we're going to be talking about income investing, specifically income investing in retirement. This is a topic we get a lot of questions on. And I really think that there's just a ton of misconceptions in general around the whole idea of income investing. So to start with, let's talk a little bit about the idea of income investing versus the idea of growth investing. So income investing is consistent, small payoffs now. So every month, every quarter, you're collecting some sort of dividend or like rent check or whatever it may be. It may grow a little bit, but for the most part, you're, you're just getting consistent, small payoffs. Um, those are things like bonds, bond funds, income annuities, preferred stocks, rental property, and, and dividend stocks. And, uh, compare this or contrast this to the idea of growth investing. And, and growth investing is a, a little bit riskier generally is, is how a lot of people look at it. And they look at it as I have a possible large payoff in the future. So I'm the extreme example of this is I'm buying Amazon way back in the early days at their IPO. And down the road, I'm, I'm hoping this turns into some, some big gigantic uh, you know, super valuable company that I own a piece of. And, you know, those are going to generally, when people talk about growth investing, they're generally talking about things like tech stocks, cryptocurrencies, maybe, maybe like flipping a property where, where they can, uh, you know, put in some equity, do, do some work, put in some sweat equity, and then, and then exit that at a much higher value. There's, there's not like rents being collected and things like that. And then also collectibles, you know, I'm going to buy this piece of artwork with the hopes that a couple of years down the road, I can sell it for much, much more. And what I really want to do, my, my goal for this presentation, primarily, number one is to get you to just get rid of this whole idea of income versus growth, because any investment can be either kind. So I could take a bond fund, and not actually collect the, the interest payments or the dividend payments that are coming out of that fund, just reinvest them all back into that fund and have kind of a, a growth vehicle. Now, do I think bonds would be a great growth vehicle? No, I don't. And if you want more information on that, check out some of my videos uh, down below in the group. Like we have hidden bonds, I think is one of them. And then now uh, we have a video on the new 6040 that that's kind of my outlook on bonds, but you could do that and, and vice versa. You could take a tech stock, you could take Amazon or, you know, any tech company that doesn't pay a dividend and you could go sell two or three or four or 5% of it now and almost create artificially create a dividend stream. And then you would have a a, a growth investment that's actually acting like an income investment. And you can keep going back and forth. A lot of people take rental properties and they'll keep you know, levering up and levering up. And, and as their portfolio is growing, instead of taking that cash out of their, of their holding companies of all these rental properties, they'll, they'll reinvest those funds through basically getting bigger loans on another property and continue to grow it and continue to grow it with the idea that down the road, they can either sell that portfolio or they just have a way bigger portfolio that's throwing off a lot more income. And uh, I mean, you could do this with anything. You could take collectibles. And, and if you had a giant portfolio of collectibles, you could actually sell, you know, individual collectibles each month, or, or a lot of people don't know this, you can actually sell interest in a collectible. So you could say, you know, you're going to, I'm going to sell you 5% of this painting or 10% of this car or boat or whatever it may be. So any investment can be any other investment. And, and what I really hope is that we can just get rid of this whole idea, the whole idea of income versus growth, because it's not about growth or income. So if I'm sitting down with a retiree, my number one concern is not like, oh boy, they need a bigger dividend yield or, oh, they need more growth stocks in their portfolio. My number one concern is growth of income. Okay, every single year, your cost of living is going to go up. What is your response? What is your strategy? What is your proactive plan to grow your income? Okay, we're not talking about an income investment. We're not talking about a growth investment. We're talking about a plan of growing income. And there's not very many ways to do that. So the problem is that a lot of people just look at just regular income investing. They look at fixed income. This is kind of the, the simplest version of income investing where you have a bond. Let's say you invest $100 in a bond and that bond's gonna pay you two bucks a year you know, for the next 10 years. Income annuity, same deal. You put in uh, five hundred thousand dollars, and they're gonna they're gonna pay you uh, thirty thousand dollars a year or something like that for life for as long as you live. Preferred stock, same deal. You're gonna put in a hundred grand. They're gonna pay you six grand a year for life. What's the problem? The problem is the income doesn't grow. So if we look at a bond fund, ten year Treasury right now, and it will be even generous and say a two percent yield. You put a hundred grand in. 
it's going to pay two grand a year. What is it paying you in year nine? Two grand a year. Okay. Income annuities. Again, you put in a hundred grand, it's paying you five grand a year. Vast majority. I mean, 95 plus percent of income annuities are not going to have growth once you turn on income. It's in, in the vast majority of them, it's not even possible for them to grow. But uh, some of them it is possible, but I don't want to get into like a, an annuity nuances video. Let's just, we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater a little bit and just say most, the vast majority of income annuities are not going to grow your income. And then preferred stock, you know, some people think, oh, if I do a preferred stock and I have a 6% yield, if the company does better, I'm going to do better. And that's not actually true. Okay. If the company gets to your 6% yield, whatever money they're making beyond that is the theirs, in, except in very extreme, very rare circumstances. So the problem with most income investing is that the income is fixed. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a feature, that's a bug. Okay, that, that's not a pro, that's a con. You don't want a fixed income. And, and here's a little bit of an illustration that I hope help make, helps make this a little bit clearer. So just imagine for a minute that you retired in 1990, and we're just going to pretend for whatever reason, uh, you weren't eligible for Social Security. Okay, instead, you're a government employee, you have a government pension of $4,000 a month in 1990. $4,000 a month sounded pretty awesome. You know, you're in a world where a stamp was 25 cents, gas was a buck 16 a gallon, 4,000 a month. I mean, that's some pretty serious purchasing power back then. But are you guys seeing the problem already? Because that 4,000 a month didn't have a cost of living adjustment like Social Security. That's why I picked on the whole situation and made it a pension. Does it still sound so awesome? Does it still, in a world where gas used to be a buck a gallon and maybe you could get by on 3,500 or $4,000 a month, back then. Well, what's happened to costs since then? Well, you don't have to guess at this. The Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks this. So you can look at CPI. And if, if you had $4,000 uh, today, so $4,000 a month today has the same buying power as $1,900 a month from January of 1990. So said a different way, if you started your pension back in January of 1990, and it was four grand a month, your lifestyle has basically cut in half. That, that four grand a month has continued to come in at a fixed rate, but your costs have gone up, gone up two or 3% a year since then. And today you're sitting there in a situation where that same pension now is buying you way less lifestyle. There's no trips happening. You know, so you, you really, you really got to focus on, on the growth piece of this. And Nick Murray, he's, he's kind of known as the advisor to advisors. He says fixed, a fixed income in a rising cost world is suicide on the installment plan. So it's, it's literally, you have a fixed income. It's guaranteed not to go down, but it's also guaranteed not to go up. And your costs are going up. You know, the last inflation report we saw, inflation was over 4%. It was almost 1% in a single month, but, but over 4% for a year. If you're, in, if you're locked into a fixed income where your costs are going up 4% a year, it's kind of like saying you're locking into a guaranteed uh, pay cut every year. You're, you're locking into a 3% or 4% pay cut every year for the rest of your retirement. Well, just on its face, that sounds totally crazy, right? And this is why what I, what I hope we can do throughout this presentation is start to shift to be uh, more big picture in our thinking. So let's just real quickly, let's eliminate all the things on this list that can't create a growing income. So bonds cannot create a growing income. That, that's fairly simple, right? Income annuities cannot create a growing income. Preferred stocks cannot create a growing income. Rental properties. Oh, well, I'm actually going to skip rental properties because you can raise your rents. So we're going to talk more about this in a minute. Uh, dividend stocks can create a growing income. We'll, we'll come back to that one. Uh, tech stocks. They might create a big income down the road, but you're not getting a consistent, stable, reliable, dependable level of income right now, at least unless you go in every month or every quarter and go sell them. So maybe a managed portfolio of tech stocks could do this, but the rest of these are very straightforward, right? Crypto is not creating a steady, consistent level of income. It's volatile. It's all over the place. I'm rooting for it. I hope it all works out in the end, but it's, it's volatile, right? So crypto can't get a, a retirement, like a stable, consistent retirement 
retirement income for somebody. Flipping properties. I mean, do you, do you want to be strapping on the uh, work belt and going out and knocking walls down and, you know, moving countertops and doing all kinds of stuff like that? Probably not. So from the standpoint of like retirement income, when we start, when we start looking at the available options for retirement income, you know, you're down to a couple of things. And when I look at collectibles, I would actually say for the vast majority of them, they're just not going to create income because you're not really going to go to the trouble of selling a piece of your collection or, or something like that. A collectible really is a growth only, appreciation only investment because I just don't see, I see a lot of people that have in this area being located in Green Bay, they have lots of sports memorabilia, a lot of, you know, Packer helmets and autograph balls and different things like that. And they go, oh man, that thing's doubled in value in the last 10 years. You know, I, I paid 300 bucks for it. It's worth 600 bucks now. And, and then I asked the question, yeah, what have you collected in dividends? You know, what have you collected in interest payments or cash flow along the way? And they say, oh, I see what you're saying. Because the market has doubled over that period and it was also paying me dividends the whole time. So collectibles can't really get that job done either. And when we get down to some of the remaining options, really want you to be careful about this because uh, I, I hope I hope in here that that my face is a little bit out of the way on the end of this graph. But don't get sucked in to what stock prices are doing. So if, if you're looking for income right now, believe it or not, I think one of your top three options is the S&P 500. You go out and you're buying something. This is a graph that shows the dividend history of the S&P 500. So if you go all the way back, you know, into the 1880s and, and we're looking at uh, uh, like seven bucks a share in dividends and you can see it just growing and growing. There was a dip uh, for the depression in there. There was a dip in, in kind of the seventies and eighties a little bit, but, but look at 2008. So, uh, you know, kind of on the, uh, uh, depending on how big your screen is, like an inch or two in from the from the right edge of the screen, you have a little bit of a dip there. That that was the financial crisis. So the the reason I throw this up on the screen is because if you had an income source that it, you know, if we chopped the left half of this graph off, if we got rid of everything 1950 and earlier, this is a pretty stable growing income. Okay, and and this is dividends on on your stocks. And uh, you know, if you, if you put say a hundred grand in to a, a port diversified portfolio of you know higher quality companies, they're going to be paying out two or three percent a year. And the key thing, the key thing, the only thing that matters, in my opinion, is that value is actually going to grow. Like that that income payment, that dividend payment, historically has had a really good track record of, of growing over over long periods of time. Why is that important? Because of inflation. So if we look at vehicles. That, that can do this, I would say don't get, don't get trapped in a mindset of, I need to find the perfect investment. I need to find the one perfect investment that is the safest way to generate retirement income. People walk into our office and say this all the time, you know, I own, I own this fund and this fund and this fund. I want safer income. Can you tell me a better fund? And here's what I'm going to share with everybody watching this Wealth Wednesday right now. What is the safest way to generate retirement income. Okay, it's it's actually not dividend stocks. It's actually not uh, some specific type of annuity. It's not managed rental properties or different things like that. The safest way to generate retirement income is a diversified, dynamic, income-focused plan. I'm gonna show you an example of what this means here in just a minute. But um, in fact, let's dive into this. So we had a client, this is not exact numbers, but this is, this is relative, uh, relatively close to, to what they came in as. I just simplified it to make it a little cleaner. They came into my office. They had a million dollar investment portfolio of which 400,000 was stocks, 400,000 was bonds, 200,000 was cash. So two, you know, 200 grand of cash, 400 grand of stocks, 400 grand of bonds. And when we got them into asking questions about this, the, the thing that they kept coming back to is they kept saying, this always just felt so cookie cutter to me, you know, 20% cash, 40% stocks, 40% bonds, you know, every couple of years, we would just go in and rebalance it. But like, what should I be doing? At this point, they were, they were getting ready for me to explain a better investment. They thought I was going to say, you need to buy the Vanguard XYZ dividend fund or the, the, uh, you know, iShares high quality uh, income 
ETF or whatever it was that they were that they were bracing for. And th this is what I said. I said, well, how much income do you need? And they told me. And I said, when do you need it? And they, they broke down some differences depending on the years and different things. I asked when they were taking Social Security. I asked if they had a pension. How's your health? What's your family history around longevity? How much of your of your portfolio here is traditional 401k, traditional IRA? All of these things are going to affect the recommendation, by the way. What tax bracket are you going to be in in retirement? Well, why, why the heck would that matter? How could you even know that? Well, well any, any reasonable advisor that has the right software packages, they can tell you in, in the current tax laws with inflation, you know, if we grow the tax brackets like 2% a year or whatever, this is probably the tax brackets that you're going to be in. And we can even stress test, you know, if, there, if there's tax increases, what that looks like to your situation. But uh, also some of these other questions, who gets this money? If something happens to you, who's this for? Is this going to a charity? Is it going to your kids? You know, how do you want to pass it to them? Because ultimately it's going to affect what should be invested where how you want this money to be passed on, how you want it to be treated, uh, what kind of tax advantages you're looking for, how your estate plan fits in with all this. These are all, you know, people look at this and they think that these are like, you know, questions that, that we need to know um, for like gathering due diligence. No, these are directly going to impact how you should invest. Answers to these questions are going to directly impact how you should invest. By the way, questions I don't have on here, we go through these a lot too. Like, you know, do, do you like working on stuff? Do you like, uh, do you like working with your hands? Do you like, because if I have someone that is very not handy and they say, Hey, I want to go invest in a bunch of rental properties. Well, they better be investing in managed rental properties where there's a company taking care of all this for them, where they're only getting a check. And when the, when the sink uh, clogs or the furnace goes out or whatever, this person is not going to be thrilled to run across town in their, in their truck and go fix this rental property. This all factors into what type of portfolio you should own. And the whole growth income debate is like, it all depends on answers to all these questions. So the question that I'll end up asking a lot of people, depending on how these questions go is, you know, we'll get into some risk tolerance types of things. And they'll say, oh, I'm really worried about the market. I'm really worried about the market, worried about the stock market crashing, worried about, you know, whatever policy in Washington. And, and, and I, I'll ask something like this. How would you feel if you knew the stock market could go into a 20 year Great Depression and you wouldn't even need to touch any of your investments? Like basically your plan would be unaffected. The market goes into a depression. You know, maybe we do some tax loss harvesting or some other cool stuff like that. But your portfolio is so robust, so durable, so designed for growing income that, you know, the market can crash, you know, and you're fine. And a lot of people say, well, then I'm pretty much comfortable with any level of risk. Like, that's a really bad scenario. And if you're telling me I'm still good in that scenario, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in this. And for this particular person, you're probably going to be surprised where this ends up going. So th this was their situation. We don't have any names on here. So no one can tell who this is. But uh, we had a situation where the, the purple down below, I should actually back up. So this orange line, that's their spending goals. So if you look over at like uh, 2023, which is the first major year in there, just say they want to spend about $65,000. That's net of taxes, net of healthcare. We, we adjust for all that in our software, but then we grow that income. So you'll see that orange line growing by about two, two and a half percent a year. Then we start looking at the different income sources. So the purple there is social security. The yellow is a small pension they had. And the light blue is their portfolio withdrawals. Now you'll notice that green up above to the right. That's the required minimum distributions. You might look at this and go, Tony, why, why are they having these distributions that are way above their income need? And the answer is they don't have a choice. Okay. This, this person has big uh, traditional IRAs out of that million dollars. It's almost all traditional IRAs. So they're going to get forced into some pretty big withdrawals down the road that are going to push them up into ta higher tax brackets. It's also going to impact their Medicare costs or something called IRMA. Lucky for them, they don't really have an Obamacare care issue on the front end of this plan, but I'm getting off track. So looking at this situation here, what I see is this is what they need. They need $60,000 a year for two years. That's kind of ultra short term that they need that. And then for the next three years, they need about $10,000 a year for three years. And I look at this and say, beyond this, even with a, with a great depression where that green bar goes way down, and, uh, you know, we could probably even cut social security and have that green bar go down and, and their situation is perfectly fine. 
So look at this. The, the, the client originally came in. I, I, I'm going to actually go back here. The client originally came in with basically, if we assume the bonds and the cash, we're going we're gonna to be generous to the bonds. And we're going to call that $600,000 safe money. In my opinion, and in, the, you know, in looking at the bigger picture of their plan, they really need say 60,000 a year for two years. So they need 120,000 of cash. And then they need 10,000 a year for about say, say three years, maybe a little further if like social security gets cut or, or other really bad things happen in the economy. So what's interesting is I'm saying with a diversified income focused portfolio, they could have 120 grand of cash $100,000 in one of the, the types of guaranteed contracts that I talk about in my new 6040 video. By the way, if you haven't seen the new 6040 video, comment new 6040 down below. I'll tag you on that video. And also, if you haven't gotten a copy of my book yet, we'll send you a copy of my book. But what I'm getting at here is we're telling this person with $220,000, 120 grand of cash, 100 grand of, of a no fee guaranteed contract they can pretty much make their retirement a lock. They, they can make it a, a darn near certain, like you can never get to 100%, but you're, you're really making the plan safe. And then they're looking at this recommendation and they're going, oh my gosh, 780,000 in the stock market. You know, I'm not gonna be able to sleep. And I, and I asked why, you know, you have the cash short term, you have the principal guarantee. We can even get into some stress testing about, you know, if we shrink this purple bar 20% and then shrink the green bar 50% because the market cuts in half, you're still hitting all your income goals. Like, why would you be losing sleep? And, and the more we talk and the more we talk, the more they start to realize, hey, if I upgrade my income investments, if I, if I take this kind of intermediate term bucket, this principal guaranteed bucket, and instead of getting maybe like 2% fixed rate of return, if I have a five or six or 7% rate of return that can actually beat inflation, still comes with a huge amount of safety in the form of a principal guarantee, yeah, I think I would sleep pretty well. I, I think my, my situation looks great and, and I feel really confident and I'm not really that worried about the other stuff. And uh, wh what would that portfolio look like? So we, uh, I'm gonna skip through this. So you know, how do I invest the rest of this money? You know, you're talking about almost $800,000 here. What do I do with it? Well, just like before, there's a whole nother series of questions that come up. When someone asks me, you know, how they should invest their money, I'll ask questions like, how do you feel about tobacco? And they'll, they'll laugh and go, what do you mean? What, what about it? You know, and we'll talk about tobacco companies. We'll talk about, you know, uh, alcohol companies. We'll talk about China. We'll talk about Russia. You know, a lot of our clients don't like to have money invested in China or Russia. And I get it, you know, not only from a, from a straight performance uh, situation, but they, they don't like investing in these countries where there's some really major human rights concerns and things like that. And I totally get it. And, and I feel like the best plan is a plan you can actually stick with. And if, if you're going to, if we're going to build you one of these dynamic defensive, you know, income plans, and then day one, you get your statement and you see that there's a fund in there that has money in China and you pull the plug on the whole thing and shut the whole plan down. We didn't help anybody. So if we really are trying to generate safe, stable, consistent income throughout retirement, these are literally questions we need to know. How do you feel about owning an oil company or a coal company? You know, how do you feel about owning big tech? How do you feel about owning Google or Twitter or different things like that? What about drug companies? How do you feel about owning a company that makes, um, you know, uh, some kind of painkiller or different? Th these are the types of questions because you, this portfolio needs to be designed for you. It needs to be a portfolio that you love to own, something that you are really excited about, something that when when things get, get a little bit uh, choppy out there in the market, that you're going to ride it out. You're going to let the plan do its job and you're going to continue to collect. You know, if, if we look at 780000 uh, invested in something that's that's paying a uh, 3% dividend yield, you're, you're collecting $23,000 in growing dividends. You know, 10 years down the road, that's probably 40 or $45,000 just in the dividend income on top of social security and everything else. So if, if you do this right, 
And, and here, what this is the example portfolio we, we ended up recommending for this person. So uh, what these different categories are, the red is large cap growth. That's going to be like tech companies and also, uh, you know, a lot of the newer healthcare companies, different things like that. Large cap value, that green bucket down in the lower left, that's going to be your Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark and uh, Berkshire Hathaway and things like that. The kind of purple color off to the left, mid cap, those are kind of your next level down of companies. These are not tiny little startups, but they're also also not JP Morgan and Bank of America and stuff like that. Um, small caps, this person was okay investing internationally in like the United Kingdom and Japan and, and places like that, Germany, they weren't comfortable investing in China. So they, they only have a developed international portfolio. Well, suddenly now they move from a cookie cutter, you know, 60% fixed income portfolio where six, they know coming into their original plan, 60% of their income was not going to grow. That That's just, they just had to accept whatever level of income. Here, their income is fine. Their income is actually literally guaranteed out to five years. And it's extremely safe beyond that, you know, like social security, essentially out beyond that. And, and I mean, look at this situation. It's radically different. I would say much more custom. I hope you'd agree with that, that it's a lot more custom than, than the situation they had before. And I'll just tell you right now, this person was so much more excited about this portfolio and what they owned and knowing the types of companies they owned and, and being willing to stick with this portfolio through the long haul. And what they're going to be rewarded with is uh, they're going to be rewarded with a bunch of tax issues down the road that luckily we can help them get out of, you know, from a conversion standpoint. And all the other things that happen. But when your money grows, it, it creates that whole other set of issues. Luckily, you can be proactive, think about them on the front end coming into it. But again, this is not a situation where there's uh, some sort of magical investment out there. I hope I'm getting that clear. There, there's not some sort of magical property you're going to go find that's going to pay you 50% income on your money that's gonna grow at 20% a year, you really need a diversified portfolio. It's gotta be a blend of a lot of different things. You need short-term money, you need intermediate term money, you need long-term money. I think you should be invested a little bit internationally if, if we can get you to. I, I think you know there's, there's a lot of ways out there to guarantee an income, but that's not a good thing. You know, If you go get a CD at, and you're getting 2% on that CD, that's all you're going to get. If inflation goes to 10%, you're going to lose 8% of your wealth. So again, this is not about fixed income. This is about finding ways to grow your income. And really what I think you should be doing is trying to own a portfolio that can grow your income as much as possible without violating your feelings of, of safety and security. So like the, the fastest way to grow income on here would be like small caps and growth stocks, you know, and mid caps and maybe a little bit of value. But like, if someone's not going to be able to hang with that, they're not going to be able to stick with it. We need to start interjecting these other things. We need to bump up the cash buffer. We need to bump up the, uh, you know, the no fee contract that's principal guaranteed. So to just wrap this all up, the safest way to generate retirement income, we know it's got to be a plan you can stick with. And what it really needs to be is diversified, dynamic, income-focused plan. You don't need more money. You need a better plan. You need a plan that is proactive about growing your income. You know, I showed in that example from 1990, stamps were a quarter. And, and then today, you know, where they've gone to, well, they're going to probably double again if there even is a post office down the road. But I mean, look at gas, look what gas has even done just here in the last few months. Look at food, look at meat, look at all these different things. You don't need more money. You don't need um, you don't need to work more. You don't need to uh, inherit or like win the lottery or something like that. What we find with the vast majority of the people that are that are in our retirement mastery group that are watching these videos, they have plenty of money right now. They're just squandering the income strategy. And what I mean by that is, you know, they're they're not planning proactively to grow their income. They're not taking advantage of all the tax opportunities that are out there. They're not tax loss harvesting. You know, they're not gains harvesting in the years that you get them down into a 0% tax bracket. There's, there's all sorts of things that, that are being left on the table and, and basically being underutilized. And this all comes back to, if you really want to know the best way to, to generate income in retirement, it's a better plan.
So this is Tony Hellenbrand from Safeguard Wealth Management. Thanks so much for joining us for another Wealth Wednesday. If there's anything in this video you got questions about, um, you know, comment down below. I'll try I'll try and answer a bunch of the, the questions in the comments as much as I can. And, uh, you know, every one of these plans is custom. Like your plan might look radically different than the one we went through. It probably does look radically different than the one we went through. But the bottom line is if you have a custom plan that's built to accomplish your goals, that is the safest way to generate the income that you need in retirement. It's not some magical investment. So again, Tony Hellenbrand from Safeguard. You don't need more money. You need a better plan. Thank you guys all so much for, uh, for joining us today for Wealth Wednesday.